Well, you will recall at the, the end of our last class, we actually had made a, a significant change. And we started to uh, talk about what's called positive psychology. And it, it, this comes from this article I mentioned by Seligman and Sixthenth Mihaly, uh, and the American psychologist. And if you remember, you know, what was unusual uh, was that our language changed so much. We began talking about all kinds of positive attributes, whereas before, uh, you know, we had been talking mostly about symptoms. And I mentioned that in positive psychology now, there, there really is an emphasis on trying to do research on all the strengths people have. That is to, to try to look at the fact that people may make better adjustments and certainly lead more fulfilling lives if we really focus on those things that are helpful to them. That is, if we focus on strengths, how you build strengths, how you build uh, virtues, uh, how you become an effective person interpersonally, let's say, rather than to study why someone is an ineffective person uh, interpersonally. And, and while you know, some might argue that this is kind of similar, I mean, you know, you're studying interpersonal functioning, but it, it is different to put your emphasis on trying to examine like why is someone dysfunctional interpersonally versus to put the emphasis on what is it that people do that make them effective uh, interpersonally. So th this is not just a, a game of semantics. Uh, th this really does make a difference. Now also, there, there, you know, some believe that if, uh, if we could create a, a world where the emphasis was on, on positive attributes, that is, if we could promote more positive functioning, then you, know, you would find that a lot of psychopathologies might be avoided. It's an interesting premise uh, you know, that uh, if we were, we're, were building a culture that, let's say, perhaps is more supportive, uh, a culture in which uh, people feel safer, a culture in which uh, you know, people can learn to grow and where growthful activities are encouraged, that perhaps uh, you know, people would find it, uh, people wouldn't develop some of the symptoms they do. And I remember uh, a very interesting case that developed uh, or, or that I heard about. I was at a conference on uh, the treatment of the seriously mentally ill. And this clinician got up and he was describing uh, a person he had followed in New York. This woman uh, lived in an Italian community. Uh, she herself was very Italian. And they had decided to knock down the houses and it was a poor area. And so they relocated the people who lived in the community. And this woman ended up living in quite a different community. And people began to notice a lot of eccentric behavior with her. Uh, they brought her to the state hospital. They actually admitted her to the state hospital. And she spent some time there. Then she uh, was released to a halfway house, which was typical of, of what they did in state hospitals. They uh, didn't want someone to, to have to reenter the community uh, without some support, so they sent him to a, a supportive environment, uh, namely a halfway house. Well, this woman, when she would get in the halfway house, people found her disruptive. Uh, people found her very emotional. Uh, people found she talked a lot. Uh, she did not make it there. And so they readmitted her to the state hospital. And this kind of thing went on a couple of times. And then you know, this enterprising clinician began looking at this woman's history and noticed that here is someone who is like 55 years old. Prior to her leaving the community she had been in, there is no indication that this woman ever was seen as having any significant emotional problem. Never hospitalized, never in psychotherapy. Uh, and the person began wondering, you know, like, well, what happened? And what he noted was this one change in her life, that is that she had to leave the community that she was in. And actually he began noticing that the halfway house, certainly the state hospital, but the halfway house was very unlike the culture she had come from. So he finds an Italian community uh, in New York and finds uh, a place where there's uh, an inexpensive place to live. 
And they relocate this woman when they release her from the hospital, not to the halfway house, but into an Italian community. And uh, this clinician, by the way, himself was Italian. And so he enjoyed following up on this woman. And what he reported was, once she was back in that community, they, she never had any problems again. That is, never had any problems that would come to the attention of the mental health world. Because the, the, the style she had of being you know, very emotional, very talkative, uh, getting very excited about things, uh, perhaps uh, being a bit pushy, uh, that in that community, nobody thought that was strange. No one would report this woman's behavior as at all bizarre. And, and what's important about that is that, uh, you know, sometimes we are, are much too aggressive at labeling people who aren't quite the way we are as somehow being disturbed. And as we go on and we talk about, uh, you know, mental health systems, by the way, you know, you'll see that uh, there are very good reasons for why we have made it much more difficult to commit someone uh, to a state hospital. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that almost any member of the family could commit any other member of the family by simply bringing somebody to the state hospital and saying, this person needs to be here. Uh, we will discuss why that happens and also the complexities of that. But, you know, people who should never have been in hospitals ended up in hospitals. And, uh, and you know, we, we have at times not been sensitive enough to a lot of the aspects of someone's personality. In fact, aspects that in one culture are strengths and then in another culture are, are seen as deviant. Now, there also are, are two other goods uh, that would come from uh, our thinking more positively. Uh, we would ta be taking people who, who don't have deficits. I mean, currently, our thinking has been so much about psychopathology that you have to have a deficit in order for us to be interested in you. Positive psychology is saying we actually ought to also focus on all the, the so-called normal people and many of them want to develop strengths, be more effective uh, to develop uh, virtues or uh, abilities that would be very helpful to them. And by thinking this way, we can help such people. Also, if you do that, then many people will become more, more productive. And, and people who have potential, that is somebody <coughs> who perhaps has a real ability to lead, let's say. If they really had a sense of leadership fostered in them, and if we were willing to teach people some of the, the skills you need, <coughs> excuse me, in being a leader, these people might become leaders. Currently, we're, we just don't focus enough in our culture on all of those, you know, many positive attributes we've been discussing. And so there, there's a feeling, and I think it's well supported, that for some people, they never achieve the potential they really have. And part of the reason can be, you know, no one has ever really helped them with that. Uh, and in some cases, you know, no one ever suggested to the person that they might have skills and abilities uh, far beyond, uh, you know, what they have. Uh, we, we saw this actually, I remember when I was working in a, in a mental health center, uh, you know, one of the secretaries was incredibly bright and talented. Uh, she was a very ethnic person, uh, married, uh, really playing, you know, the, the role of being the wife. Uh, uh, she was also, the husband was in school, so she was, you know, the breadwinner. But, you know, that's really what she was going to do. And many of us started noticing qualities like she was very empathic with patients. Uh, very comfortable in relating to people who had e extreme symptoms. And, uh, and she began also recognizing some of this in herself, but the people around her began saying, uh, you know, have you ever thought about perhaps entering clinical psychology? And, you know, she thought, well, well I mean, you know, that's just not something that I, I ever thought about. But people began encouraging her. Well, she, she decided to apply to graduate school, and indeed, she got in. Indeed, she got a PhD, and indeed, she is a very effective person today. Uh, it, it's, you know, that was a chance thing. Had that woman chosen to become 
a secretary, you know, perhaps uh, at an oil company, um, no one may ever have really encouraged all of this talent in her. And there are kind of untold stories like this. Certainly, uh, some of you probably can uh, look at your grandparents, especially if your grandparents weren't very educated. Uh, and so in my case, my grandparents, my wife's grandparents were not very educated. What we recognize is they were very bright. I mean, they did not get degrees. They didn't even get out of grade school. But there's no question that a lot of potential was lost because they came from a very ethnic culture that didn't encourage uh, you know, them to develop their strengths. No one paid much attention to their strengths. Uh, they simply fulfilled roles. Positive psychology is trying to say we're, we're missing a tremendous amount of talent by this focus on people's deficits and then try and, if you have a deficit, we try to get you to be so-called normal. And we also have to start looking at the so-called normal and how this person might function a lot better if we simply provided uh, a learning environment that allowed them to acquire more. Now, you know, we can look at positive psychology from, uh, from a number of perspectives, and I'm going to choose three. First of all, there's positive experience. What makes one moment better than the next? Now, you know, think about this yourself. Uh, when you, when this question is asked, you think about it. I mean, you say to yourself, yeah, I, I can recognize, you know, some moments are better than others. But if I ask you, what will you tell me? What does make one moment better than the next? I mean, what would change, you know, your experience of today? Think about it. Give me one answer. What would change? What do you think does change the world for you? I mean, what do you think happens that you feel differently from one moment to the next? Now, surely, you can think of something. <laughs> OK. So by anything, maybe you're saying that certain st that stimuli have the potential. Okay? Now let's put labels on that. What, what kind of stimuli? I think that if uh, from moment to moment something can be more desirable to you than mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. the way you feel about the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Such as somebody, I could win the lottery in the next hours mm -hmm. versus now I'm broke. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you used uh, an example, but it, it's an exceptional one, eh? Uh, it's a surprise, but it's a huge surprise. I mean, that takes place. Uh, so something can happen that, that you feel would change your life. Okay. How about something more subtle? What, what kinds of things, you know, will change you from moment to moment? Yeah, uh, something new happens to you. So if the new thing is good, is positive, then you can find yourself feeling, I feel a lot better now. Uh, let's say, you know, somebody has walked over and they, they hugged you. And somebody you really like. And you feel, oh, I am so glad this person hugged me. I, I like this person. Uh, on the other hand, let's say that same person uh, you happen to meet as you're walking out, and the person snubs you. And you felt all along, you know, you're kind of good friends, and the person walks by, doesn't say hello. So, you know, 60 seconds ago, you would have said, you know, this, I like this person, we're friends. 60 seconds later, you're feeling, I wonder why this person snubbed me. So, you know, there, there are events that occur, and they're occurring all the time. Uh, we don't spend enough time, though, examining like which of those events are really meaningful for you. Now, one you can think of that might you know, change uh, you from, from time to time, actually it can happen quick, if you want to take a broad category, it would be information. You learn something new. 
And whatever it is that, that you learn may either cause you to, to feel very good, uh, or it, it may cause you to, uh, to not feel good. And the same information can differ from person to person. For example, if we walk out of class today and it's pouring rain, some of you may respond, you know, kind of angrily, I hate rain. Uh, I don't want to go out there and get drenched. I've got to get somewhere right away. Uh, this is very inopportune. And all of a sudden, and you may have walked out of here actually feeling pretty good, and suddenly, you know, you're irked by the fact that it's raining. The person you are with may say, oh, thank heavens it's raining. You know, my flowers were getting dried up, my lawn was getting dried up, and now, you know, this is going to be very helpful. So it's the same event, it's the same information, but depending on the person, you can have very different emotional responses. So it, it's important for us, you know, to be careful about stereotyping things. There often uh, an event for one person is quite differently experienced than an event for another person. Information for one person may be experienced differently than information for another person. Uh, Let's take our person that, uh, you know, an individual runs into. Uh, you know, one person may find out, that person doesn't like me, and uh, that's very upsetting to me. Uh, the person's companion may say, I could care less what that person thinks about me. I have no interest. So, you know, it, it depends on the kind of information. It depends on the kind of value we put on it depends on the kind of value we put on certain experiences, that will determine you know, whether or not uh, something is good or bad. And, and as a result, we find that one moment really can be better than the next. We can determine it to some degree. And also, we can change it by you know, knowing how to respond to information that is either good or not good. Now, second is the question, <laughs> What makes a positive personality? <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> what does make a positive personality? Let us find out from a class filled with talented personalities. <clears throat> what do you think makes a positive personality? <clears throat> Surely, Mr. Edmund. <clears throat> uh, somebody who's like really agreeable or nice outgoing but friendly mm hmm okay so, so you're feeling one thing about personality is that the person is agreeable friendly person reaches out these are are very desirable qualities okay what else might you posit makes a positive personality sure mr. Oponi I think maybe like uh, no matter what happens in, the, in their outside environment, they still always remain like their well-being is always intact. Uh, they're not deterred. Um, I guess you know the typical positive, you know, like not happy like with like with disregard to their environment around them. But if things are go going good or bad in the mm -hmm. outside environment, they still have this this even. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying you know if someone's pretty steady, that you know. Even though things happen that perhaps might be a bit upsetting, uh, that doesn't cause them to make great changes. Uh, or if good things happen, they, they accommodate those things nicely. But the, your, per good per your personality is someone, they're pretty predictable. They're pretty a steady person. You can count on them. Okay? Ms. Hofstetter, you were going to. He said exactly what I was going to say, and he said it better. <laughs> I was just going to say someone you know, that, that always had a positive outlook, that, you know, that not every situation was a Mm -hmm. You know, they were comfortable with whatever came, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't uh, overwhelming to be like, just, you know, positive, mm -hmm. something that they could do with Okay. So you're saying that, uh, you know, people who have a certain optimism, people who, uh, you know, can, can take things and, and use them to their advantage, and they don't get too upset about them. Anything else? Any other quality you can think about that you think makes for a positive personality? I think you have to feel good about yourself. Okay. 
Maybe that's the first one, eh? <laughs> is okay, and uh, you know, Ms. Bro brings up, you know, what may be the, the basic premise, which is you've got to start with yourself, and you've kind of got to feel that, you know, this is, um, you know, I feel good about myself. This is the way I am, but this is okay. Now, you notice, if you look at the, the descriptors we've gotten, uh, there are certain things we don't want to see in a personality that we certainly wouldn't call positive. What, what are the implications for what we don't want to see by what we just said we want to see? What don't we want to see? Okay. Mr. Jones says, we don't want to see a disregard for other people. That certainly seems very reasonable. What else don't we want to see? Or what else is implied by? Great. Sure. Uh, the way in which uh, we have been talking, if we want to see somebody who is likable and, uh, and constant <clears throat> and reaches out, what we are saying is we don't want people who are hostile, people who are unpredictable, uh, people who are unpleasant, people who are interpersonally uh, negative. Uh, so, you know, we, and, and the reason why I think it's important to look at both sides of that is if I were to uh, ask you, well, why don't I do it? Tell me about a negative personality. What can you tell me about negative personalities? What are things you don't like or you think other people don't like? Well, I think I'm kind of having a negative personality about the test. <laughs> 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 you need to be more positive about them. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Bro, you're... You're not feeling good about the test is probably not a personality characteristic. <laughs> what else, though? What, what kinds of things do you think are negative attributes of personality? Sure. Yeah, well, you mentioned, like, um, about some qualities like uh, courage, you know, love and vocation, but so this being, like, the opposite of that, you know, displaying cowardice. He's saying, like, no, no interpersonal skills, just being an isolated individual. Because he said, like, yeah. you, have to, you have an individual quality as well as qualities that's connected with other people, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. Sure, being cowardly, uh, being uh, interpersonally ineffective, um, perhaps being hostile. Now, the reason why I said that, and I actually thought you might come up with more things, people typically are able to... Um, you know, kind of describe negatives about people. I mean, usually when you say to someone, like, what's, a ne what, what's negative about people? Uh, you know, people can usually pretty quickly identify things that upset them. Uh, we, we tend to be that way. We know those things that we don't like. Now, we know the things that we like, but often we have to do more thinking about it. And in our culture, and certainly in, in the field of psychology, we haven't spent nearly the time on talking about these, these strengths and these likable qualities as we've spent, you know, really trying to study problems. Now, one of the things about a positive personality, that, that this variable, is that it focuses on empowering people. That is, if you're, you're going to, um, to try to improve uh, people, you want to you create a, a positive approach, the first thing you have to do is empower people. And you know, that's the, the thing. Uh, Ms. Bro made the, this case that, you know, you have to like yourself. I mean, that's the beginning. <coughs> you know, once you like yourself, then we have to begin to ask you, you know, what are some of the things, you know, you might like to even improve in yourself? And then that becomes uh, the thing that this focus on. And so, you know, some of the things you might teach someone are things like uh, how human beings uh, become self-organizing, how they become self-directive. And, and how they adapt to whatever kinds of issues uh, come before them. Uh, you know, those are important skills. Often our focus is, if something new happens to you and you don't collapse, that is, we don't have to take care of you, 
we don't pay a lot of attention to you. You know, we don't pay attention to whether or not you actually took this new uh, experience and used it as an initiative, that, that you got stronger, that you got better, that, you know, good things, uh, you know, occurred for you. So it, it really is important uh, that we recognize that there is a, a vast world uh, that psychology should deal with, and it hasn't quite got there yet. Okay, now, the next perspective, or the third variable here, is recognition that people and experiences are embedded in a social context. Thus, what this really means is that, that positive psychology needs to take positive communities and positive institutions into account. And, you know, you can see in the example I was giving you about this uh, Italian woman who ended up in a state hospital, you know, for her, her ethnic community obviously had been a very positive force for her throughout her life. I mean, she did fine. Uh, as far as anybody could see, she never had a problem. But when she lost, you know, all that support, she lost that environment that was really helpful to her, uh, she couldn't look around and adjust to new expectations. So she remained the person that she was, and that person ends up getting extruded uh, from the new environment. And, you know, we need to look at environments uh, like why do people have such difficulty taking in someone who's new, someone who's different, someone whose mannerisms and style uh, and customs perhaps are not the same. Uh, we talk about it, but we haven't really studied it enough to be able to make changes. Now, there's a psychologist named David Buss who actually ha has written on evolutionary perspectives that influence positive psychology. And what he kind of notes is like, you know, the, the dead hand of the past weighs very heavily on the present. And he focuses primarily on three reasons why positive states of mind are so elusive. And you want to remember now that this is a person coming from almost a, you know, an evolutionary or ecological uh, perspective. And so, he says, because the environments that people currently live in are so different from their ancestral environments to which their bodies and minds have been adapted, they often are misfits in modern surroundings. Now, for those of you who have taken personality theory, uh, you will have studied um, Carl Jung. This has some of that collective unconscious uh, that Carl Jung talks about. That is, in, in Jung, when you're born, uh, you're not just an empty vehicle that's going to learn from, from birth. Instead, you know, his belief was you had what he called archetypes, ancestral archetypes, that is, experiences that took place in your ancestor, ancestors, actually are available to you. And what we have uh, here is Buss saying, we may have adjusted uh, you know, to societies in the past, and the dramatic changes that are going on for us now, we're not prepared to deal with. Now, the second one is that evolved distress mechanisms are often functional. And distress mechanisms, you happen to use that term, other people would use other terms, but, uh, but one, one example he used was that if you're in a culture where you value loved ones, let's say especially you value a very special loved one, but uh, loved ones don't necessarily remain very faithful to each other, then what you develop is a sense of jealousy. And, and you develop this jealousy because you worry so much that someone will steal your loved one or that your loved one will be unfaithful to you, will become involved with another person. And, and he was saying, you know, you, from his perspective, you really wouldn't have to have jealousy. I mean, jealousy is not just an emotion that everybody necessarily experiences. He sees it as a mechanism uh, for coping. That is, 
someone becomes suspicious about what their uh, most important person is up to because they've developed great fears that they will lose them. Uh, one could argue both pro and con, whether or not that really is a mechanism that develops that way. Then the third is that selection tends to be competitive and it involves uh, a zero sum outcome. What we mean uh, by this is that if you recall in some of our theories, we, we posited you, know, you only have a certain amount of energy. And so if you have to put a lot of your energy into a world uh, to protect yourself, that is, you, you know, you're, you're, you feel you've got to be competitive with a lot of other people. Uh, you feel you've got to devote a lot of energy into looking out for those things that are of value to you. That doesn't leave you with a lot of energy to devote to growthful things like we've been talking about. And so he is really saying it becomes important that you have as much energy freed up as possible so you can devote it uh, to you know, really being a growthful person. Now, Buss does make a, you know, a number of interesting observations. One is that, you know, today, people live surrounded by many more people than their ancestors did. Uh, and I think we can certainly see that. I mean, you know, you did not have these huge cities historically that we have now. Yet, he would say, while people are surrounded by many more people now than their ancestors were, people tend to be intimate with fewer individuals and that people probably experience more loneliness and alienation uh, today than they experienced in smaller communities. Now this phenomena is one, uh, you know, I think it's easy to recognize. If you happen to come from a small town, one of the things you probably would say is, you know, everybody in our town knew everybody else. I mean, the, you, you know, you couldn't hide in the town. Everybody knew everybody by name if it's a small town. Uh, and people talked to each other, but you had, there was lots of social interaction. On the other hand, you know, in, in, in Houston, you could live in a high-rise building that had 2,000 people in it and not know anybody, you know. You could be in your apartment and nobody pays attention to you. Uh, you get on the elevator, you run into various people every day, but nobody responds. So you could be living in a fairly large community in a very tight environment, you know, a one square block environment and you've got hundreds of people and you don't know any of them and none of them seem to be interested in getting to know you and i remember at, a, at another university i was at i was talking to a student who happened to be the student government president and she was telling me uh you know what she had learned about uh you know being at the university and one of the things was she said she came from a town whose population was smaller than the dorm in which she lived. So on the campus, she said, just her dorm alone was a bigger population than the entire town she came from. And she said it was really a great learning for her because even though she became very popular, uh, she realized how many people, even in the dorm, she didn't know. And how many people didn't seem to really have it, be very eager to, uh, to get to know her. And, uh, and she said, you know, in the town she came from, that just couldn't happen. I mean, everybody would say hello. Everybody would know your name. Now, Buss also notes that psychological choices do involve the need to, to reproduce optimal experiences. That is, if good things happen to you, you want to make them happen again. And, and what he said is that healthy people, whenever possible, choose behaviors that make them feel fully alive and make them feel competent and make them feel creative. And of course, this is a very different focus than examining what causes individuals you know, to be depressed or to be anxious. Uh, but we spend much more of our time with the latter. Now, in positive psychology, there are a number of personal traits that contribute to our well-being. And you'll see, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of these. There's subjective well-being, there's optimism, there's happiness, there's self-determinism. Now, subjective well-being refers to what people think. 
and how they feel about their lives. It refers to the, to the cognitive and affective conclusions they reach when they evaluate their existence. Now, you know, even the ancient philosophers had some insight into this area. Pre-Christian philosophers, for example, agreed it is not what happens to people that determines how happy they are, but rather it's how people interpret what happens to them that creates their happiness. And, and if you recall, a couple lectures ago, I, I, was, I gave you this example. You know, you have two women who go to a party, and this guy walks in. And one woman sees this guy as having a very nice smile, highly desirable person. The other woman sees the guy having a smirk. Now, you, you've got two people, you've got the same experience, you've got uh, an unknown other person, so we have no idea what this guy is really like. But the openness of one person to see positive things is going to allow her to go over and perhaps, you know, introduce herself and begin a conversation. The other person is going to protect herself. But there's a cost to protecting yourself because it means then you don't reach out. <laughs> you know, you don't try to get to know somebody else. So it, the mechanism that seems to be self-protective, in fact, you could say it is self-protective, but it's not self-protective uh, at no cost. Actually, if one continues this kind of style, it, it's self-protective at, at significant cost. Now, one dispositional trait that appears to mediate between external events and a person's interpretation of them is optimism. The question is, how does optimism work? And if you have it, how can it be increased? And you also have to ask the question, when does optimism distort reality? Uh, who knows what a Pollyanna is? What's a Pollyanna? Ah, yes, Mr. Jones says a, a goody-goody girl, exactly. And, and when you say goody-goody girl, what, what are you saying about her? I mean, what's your, your kind of fantasy about? What's this person like? Okay, prudish, prim and proper. Okay, there are even more characteristics. What else can you think? Surely you've heard the term used. She's a Pollyanna. And usually it is, could be used for a male, but it's almost always used for a female. But, but the personality characteristics are not really gender determined. What is it? There are all the things that Mr. Jones just said. Okay, this is the person who smiles no matter what's happening. You know, this person can only see a positive side of things. Now, this is someone, and, and, and I think you described this well, we tend to think of her as superficial. You know, you don't see much depth in this person. In fact, in spite of the fact that this person only does positive things, I mean, she's always happy, always smiling, always saying good things, actually, a lot of people are bugged by her. There's, there's a sense that this is unreal, that, you know, she can only experience one side of life and that, uh, and not very deeply. So when you, you look at optimism, I mean, you have to look at it as, is it a genuine quality? You know, is the person really optimistic? That is, they have evaluated what's going on. They're able to respond to good things, not that it is an automatic kind of fixed smile uh, and way of relating to life. Now, we do know, though, that real optimism is linked to, to many positive outcomes in our lives, and in fact, in our everyday life. Uh, in fact, people are more and more coming to believe that, that if, if they really do think something can happen, uh, it will actually contribute to their being successful. That is often you know, you even hear people say things like, you know, believe in it. Believe in yourself. Uh, if you believe in yourself, good things can happen. Uh, and actually, if, if you are not optimistic, it doesn't take a lot to figure out 
maybe you won't put the energy, you know, into uh, something that you really could do, do well and be successful. So optimism is important. Then happiness is another important variable uh, for positive psychology. And some aspects of it, you know, really are, are not very fashionable. Uh, one is, you know, the often found association between happiness and, and religion. Uh, you know, today where, where many people are leaving their religions or, or, or just don't participate in religion, uh, some people even are angry with religions. But we do find, to, to be very honest, that those people who partake and involve themselves in some kind of religion or some kind of spiritual life uh, tend to experience a happiness from it. Uh, they tend to get good things from it. Uh, obviously, though, uh, those people who don't get that leave it. So those who are left, who are still participants, uh, are finding this is very helpful to them. Isn't happiness kind of contingent on the first two traits we just talked about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you I mean you've got to be optimistic first, or you're not going to, to, to be a happy person. You've got to believe you're going to be happy. Uh, and certainly, there has to be a certain you know, subjective sense that you know, you're a good person. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. And, and you could say some of these things do kind of unfold one into the other. Now, also, uh, there's been a strong relationship has been shown between personal relationships and happiness. And, you know, if you, if you don't have some very uh, real friends uh, that you feel good about, you know they feel good about you, that does get in the way of happiness. And, and friendship is so important that what we have found in studies is there's a high correlation between having good uh, best friends, uh, perhaps intimate friends, of caring friends, and your happiness. And in spite of what our culture you know, brings before us, we find very little correlation between the amount of wealth or goods you have and whether you're happy. And in fact, if you look at these studies, what happens is and if you remember, uh, you know, in Maslow's uh, hierarchy, you know, the, the, there are certain things you have to have in your life. I mean, you have to have warmth. Uh, you need to have food. Uh, you know, you need to not be thirsty, starving. You need to have a place to live. Uh, I mean, if, if those things are, are lost to you, you don't have them, then you won't be happy. So there's kind of a baseline. You've got to have enough of this world's goods so that you can feel, you know, minimally safe. I can, I have a place to go home to, uh, I can eat tonight uh, if I wanted to go out, let's say, to a movie or something like that, like that. I have enough resources. Now, once you get past that kind of minimal level, it's very interesting. The studies show that there's not a whole lot of relationship between gathering a lot more money, let's say, have, you know, having enough money that you can do anything you want, and whether you're happy. And, you know, we certainly... Uh, with modern television, you know, kind of almost a door, if you look at a lot of the shows that are on, uh, wealth, you know, people really having a lot of wealth. But uh, the fact is, uh, there's not any indication that many of those people are really enjoying their life much. Uh, you know, some uh, are getting married and divorced at a, a very rapid pace. Uh, you, uh, and when you read sometimes about, you know, how they got to know somebody and how they got married, you realize that Relationship was incredibly superficial. People hardly knew each other. It takes them about two weeks to get to know each other a little better. That's enough time for them to get divorced. Um, and yet, they, these people have tremendous resources, you know. And so, it, it's an interesting phenomenon that happiness seems to be quite independent of really how many economic resources you have. That, that your income, once it gets to a certain very modest level, becomes not a determiner of whether or not you're going to have an enjoyable life. Now then, there's self-determination. And self-determination theory investigates three related human needs. One is the, the, the need for competency. Uh, and, you know, here, there's not much question. You have to be a believer that you, know, you actually are going to be able to accomplish whatever it is you wish. That is, you have to believe, 
I do have the internal resources uh, to get done certain things. And so the first step, uh, and this I think is hierarchical too, as Mr. Jones had just pointed out, you've got to have this first thing. That is, you've you got to have the, this sense of competence. But that's not enough. Because what that progresses to is you then have to have a feeling uh, that you belong. And, you know, we all feel that need. I mean, we, as much sometimes uh, as people want to say, you know, I don't need others. Uh, that's always untrue. Uh, you know, there, there's no one who really can lead, uh, at least very rare, anybody leads a totally isolated life. Even if you look at, you know, maybe the extreme, uh, there are some monks, you know, who go off uh, and, and they lead very ascetic lives. Uh, in the extreme, there are these monks who, you know, live in poverty. They have their own little hut on the side of a hill. You know, they belong to a religious order, but each monk kind of has, you know, his own little place. And they, they never talk. And they work the land. But even in though, with that situation, those people come together for common prayer. Uh, they, they are, and they are perceived as part of a community. Uh, and they know they're part of a community, and that's important to them. So the idea is, no, no matter how extreme you want to get, the reality is, if you're honest, you will, you will admit, I need to belong. So the kind of choices you make uh, are, are very important. That leads to the next issue. That is, in self-determination theory, you also need to be autonomous. That is, you need to belong, but you also need to be able to make your own decisions. So if there's too big a price for belonging, that is, you have to give up yourself. That you, know, you feel, I cannot be the me I would like to be. Then you have a real problem. And, and that's, that's very difficult uh, because the the need to belong is, is very intense in all of us. The ability to belong to something where you don't lose yourself, where you can also be yourself, is the key to whether you're going to be really happy. Now, when these needs are satisfied, personal well-being and social development at least become optimized. Persons uh, that are in the state that we've been describing now are intrinsically motivated. And very importantly, they're at a state where they can really fulfill their own potentials. And they're able to seek out progressively greater challenges. Now, self-determination also involves a certain autonomy. And, and this is a tricky area. In one case, the emphasis is on autonomy in our culture Actually, the emphasis on autonomy in our culture can, can be a kind of tyranny. That is, you know, an, an excessive freedom that, that actually in many people leads to dissatisfaction and depression. Uh, if you are so autonomous that you don't get help from others, if you're so autonomous that, I mean, you feel you've got to make every single decision yourself, no one gives you guidance, no one gives you much support, actually, being autonomous becomes a burden. And, and for some people, the, the responsibility that they begin to feel, because everything that they do, they feel is there, you know, they have to do, uh, the, the responsibility gets very heavy. And the strange thing is that if you're so autonomous that you, you are not incorporated into some kind of a culture where you get feedback and where people are helpful to you and yet, and yet people let you do the things that you want to do, if you don't have that kind of surrounding, actually you get depressed and you develop symptoms. It's a very complicated uh, issue and it's a very tricky issue. So what all of us need to do is to understand there are cultural constraints. And actually cultural constraints are, are really necessary for leading a meaningful life. And also they're very necessary for, for leading a satisfying life. So the, there is a, a real delicate balance and a delicate difference between cultural constraints that actually are informative to you, that, are, that create support for you, that kind of guide you and give you a sense of, of where it's probably best to go, versus cultural constraints that inhibit you, that keep you from being as much of a person as you could be.
And that's kind of the, the you know, part of the process of self-discovery, which is discovery of, of how you function in society. Now, positive psychology also has implications uh, for mental and physical health. Uh, a person named George Valent, and Valent is spelled V-A-I-L-L-A-N-T. And George Valen pointed out that positive psychology actually has many implications for mental and physical health through the whole life cycle. And he, he emphasized that a positive psychological adaptation is something that actually unfolds as life goes on. It's not like, you know, you have it and you want to hold on to it. It's that if you are really a developing human being, then you will begin to, uh, to unfold and you'll become more and more positive as you move on. And he even, uh, you know, commented on things that he called mature uh, defenses. And these are very different than others you've heard about. Uh, he talked about altruism, you know, that being able to care about society actually is, is an important, uh, what he called, defense that enables you to really participate in society. He felt you have to have some ability to suppress. That is, you can't just let out every feeling you have. He also felt that things like humor and anticipation are, are very important if you're going to work well in, in any society. And he felt that it, it's these mechanisms that actually contribute to a successful and to a, a joyful life. And, and you know, it, it, the, when we talk about these, uh, what makes them complicated is we sometimes use the same word for something that either could be enhancing to us or at the same time it could be problematic to us. And so we have to be able to figure out whether or not, you know, how much of something works for us and when that very variable has now begun to get in our way. Well now in our, our next class we're going to continue a little bit of this and then we're going to get into the fascinating world of assessment and diagnosis. But we'll take a break for now. <laughs>